Now, Lord, speak to us and through us. Let us hear things that need to be heard by you and said by you. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. 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 Again, we say to you, welcome. Uh, hello. So I'm Lee Becker, and I'm uh, sta standing in for Theron Johnson, who couldn't be here tonight. And I'm sorry that he's not here. I plan to uh, attend and video record the session myself. Uh, I would have enjoyed meeting him and observing him as the moderator. I didn't write the questions th that I will read tonight. They were written by the representatives of the Western Circuit Bar Association and given to me by Judge Hope. I did read them and uh, suggested some minor, minor editing, which was accepted. I believe you will find the questions fair, and I believe you'll be informed by the answers. My role tonight will be to read these questions and direct them to the appropriate candidate. Some of them are for both candidates, and some of them are specific to one candidate or the other. The candidates have agreed to a format that gives them two minutes to respond to each question. Uh, if one candidate mentions the other or the other's position on some issues, I will allow a one-minute rebuttal. That'll be at my discretion. And then if the other candidate wishes to have 30 seconds to respond to the rebuttal, I will allow that. Um, so with that, we'll start with three-minute introductions. And who has won the toss? He's going first. He's yeah. going first. Okay. You're well, on. thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you to Reverend Lett and Hill Chapel Baptist Church. Thank you to Links Incorporated and the Western Circuit Bar Association for coordinating this event. And thank you all for coming here tonight. My name is Kalki Yalman Chili. I'm running to be your next district attorney as an independent candidate because I believe that the district attorney's office is a place for public service, not for politics. I'm working to earn your vote because I believe this community deserves a district attorney's office that can deliver justice for victims in serious violent felony cases, that can connect people who are accused of a crime that's nonviolent with resources in the community, that can help them address the underlying substance abuse, mental health, or other issue they're facing that brought them into contact with the criminal justice system to begin with, and get back to living a healthy life and being a part of their family and contributing to their community. And I'm running because I believe we've got an obligation as a community to do a better job of connecting young people in our community, whether they've gotten in trouble or they haven't gotten in trouble with resources and relationships that make it easier for them to make good decisions. And I've spent the entirety of my career preparing to have the experience and training, not just to set those goals, but to deliver on them. I've spent my entire legal career doing criminal justice work. I spent over six years as a prosecutor at the beginning of my legal career, including five and a half years here at the Western Judicial Circuit District Attorney's Office. I've successfully tried to a jury every kind of criminal case from a DUI to a murder. Uh, and I have also mentored young attorneys to give them the tools and the resources that they need to operate and serve their communities and be successful in those roles. I've advocated for victims for justice in their case while still respecting and honoring the procedural and constitutional rights of people who are charged with crimes in our community. And I've taught a class at the University of Georgia's Law School for three years before this fall on criminal litigation, which helped me refine the skills that you need to teach young attorneys and new attorneys what they need to know in order to be successful in the criminal justice process. I've called this community home for 17 of the last 21 years, basically the entirety of my adult life. I uh, love this community. It's where my wife, Caitlin, and I have chosen to raise our family. Uh, and I'm doing this because I know that my children, Asher and James, and my family, and you and your families, and everybody that we share this community with deserves not just a district attorney's office that's trying to get back to being minimally active minimally adequate, but one of the best in the state of Georgia that's committed to doing the right thing the right way, regardless of whether anyone is watching. And that's what I'm committed to delivering for you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. How are you doing tonight? You know, it is wonderful to look around the room and see it so full. This is important, and we can tell that it's important to you. 
And so I just want to say thank you for being here today. I also want to say, because there are going to be lots of questions that you're not going to get to ask today, there are three more of these scheduled. So you will have other opportunities, and I hope that you take advantage of going to each of those. I was joking with a young student that said, if you go to all four, you get a gold star. After we say our thank yous to those who host us today and this evening, I also want to reintroduce you to who I am. I'm Deborah Gonzalez. I am the district attorney that the majority of the people in this circuit elected in 2020 after a very hard-won fight to make sure that we would have an election in the first place after it was canceled by the governor. Many of you think you know me. Many of you do know me. I'm a mother of three with my husband. We have five grandchildren and two fur babies. I have lived in this community since 2007. And I have served not only as your DA for the past four years, but I have also served as a state representative for Athens for two years in the state capitol. So not only do I know about the laws that we're trying to enforce, I also know how those laws were made before they even get to our court system. But why was I elected four years ago? Well, we had had two DAs in 48 years. We had the same kind of tough on crime, punishment-based approach to justice that we had for hundreds of years. And back then, my community told me they wanted something different. They didn't want the same approach to justice. And the thing was that times had changed. When I walked into office on January 1st, 2021, we were in a post-COVID world. We were in a world where we were in the middle of a judicial emergency that closed down jury trials and grand juries for 18 months. We were in a world that everybody changed their relationship to what work meant, where they had to do it, and what they were going to do. So there is the pre-COVID world, and there is the post-COVID world. And I submit to you that I am the person with the experience in the post-COVID world. Now, we knew when I walked in that pushback was going to be swift. We didn't know it would be this nasty or this hostile. And there have been many opportunities given to me to just step aside and let this go. But I stand here today to tell you I never took any of those opportunities. I stood here to continue the fight when sometimes just my presence made it difficult for others. And I'm asking you, and I look forward to answering your questions tonight and setting the record straight. Thank you. Okay, thank you both. Uh, so the first question actually will I'll give you a chance to restate some things that you've already said in your introductions, but I'm going to ask it in the way in which it was given to me. Uh, in the state of Georgia, the district attorney has several important duties and awesome responsibilities. Even through their, often through their assistant district attorneys, but with the guidance of the elected DA, they make changing charging decisions, make bond recommendations, and negotiate plea agreements that daily affect the lives of those who live in the Western Circuit. Their office represents the state of trial on all felony offenses for the circuit, including crimes as serious as murder, rape, and child molestation. The job entails a tremendous amount of work and responsibility for what many in the legal community would consider low pay. Each of you could earn more income in private practice than you would as the elected district attorney. Why do you want to be the district attorney for the Western Judicial Circuit? And I think we should alternate, so Deborah, why don't you go next? Okay, well, thank you, and thank you for that question. Well, nobody's going to do this to get rich. But I have been a public servant since 2017, and even before then in working with the community. I come from an army and military family. They call us army brats because we would travel around um, and never just stay in one place. But to me, the idea of duty and service to my community is one of my biggest priorities. It's why I ran to be state representative, and it's why I ran when I was asked to, to be your district attorney. Why? Because sometimes when you go out there, and I can tell you that when it was first approached to me, I actually asked six other attorneys in our circuit if they would run, if they would become the district attorney, because what was important to me was that we needed a change. 
And they all gave me the same answer. No, we're not politicians. We don't want to campaign. We don't want to fundraise. You run, we will work for you. Well, I ran, I won, but they didn't work for me. They decided that they were having too much fun and too much money in what they were doing, but they did serve as advisors as we did that first transition year. Why I'm asking to be reelected is because the work is not done. MLK said that arc of history bends towards justice, but it takes a long time. It is not done overnight. And if I was naive in the beginning, I thought with prosecutorial discretion that we would be able to get a lot more done in a lot quicker time. And I learned that's not the case because there are others involved in the system, including judges. And they have the last word, as Judge Hope has told you. And so I run because the work is not done. I run because anything that's worth it and our community is worth it takes time, takes grit, takes persistence, and it takes a commitment to the long haul. This will not be done overnight. There's plenty of work to do. We are proud of what we've done, and we have more to do. Thank you. So uh, I see my parents who texted me earlier today and asked if it was OK if they came tonight. And so they drove over from Atlanta. But um, they're here. And I guess I start from the fact that you know, I, me and my sister were born here in the United States. And my parents immigrated here from India. Uh, and they really showed us from a very young age the incredible blessing that we had by being born in this country. And we traveled back often to see family members in India. And so from a young age, I also saw that in one generation, the difference between the opportunities that I had and the opportunities they had, because I was being raised in a country that was committed to a foundational commitment to the rule of law being applied equally to all people and how important it was to push that forward and to create a more perfect union and fix the issues that we see in front of us. Uh, I've sat in the room with crime victims who have had terrible things happen to them. I know the intense need that they have to have an advocate for justice in their case who's an expert, who's trained, who understands how to get results in the courtroom. I've also been to a number of drug court graduations and identified people who have underlying substance abuse issues and haven't uh, been connected with significant treatment resources. A lot of times because they don't have the financial resources in their old life and we have those things available to us in the court system. And so for me, living in a community and knowing the great work a DA's office can do, I wanted to create an office that honors those crime victims and moves us forward in connecting people with resources. And the reality of that situation is that we are going backwards when it comes to helping people and connecting them with resources. And we are failing when it comes to delivering justice for victims in the courtroom. And I know that I can make that change for this place that I love. Okay. Uh, second question, and uh, then Kalki will go first with this one. Okay. Uh, the ABA, the American Bar Association, standards for prosecutors state that, and I'm quoting, the prosecutor should seek to protect the innocent and convict the guilty, consider the interests of victims and witnesses, and respect the constitutional and legal rights of all persons, including suspects and defendants. The prosecutor serves the public interest and should act with integrity and balanced judgment to increase public safety both by pursuing appropriate criminal charges of appropriate severity and by exercising discretion to not pursue criminal charges in appropriate circumstances. The primary duty of the prosecutor is to seek justice within the balance of the law, not merely to convict. And that's the end of the quote. Do you agree with these standards, and can you describe your prosecution philosophy? Yes. I mean, my philosophy comes down to what I was talking about of the ethos of the office I would lead. Do the right thing the right way, regardless of whether anyone is watching. What that means is understanding the law, looking at the surrounding circumstances of what's happened, and making your decision without fear or favor, and making sure that you're being fair and equally applying the law to all people. I mean, I've said plenty of times, you know, not before this, I mean, not just after this campaign started, but, you know, before when I was 
prosecutor. When I've been teaching that class at UGA's law school, a prosecutor's job is unique in the law in that your job is not to advocate for the best possible outcome for a client regardless of what you think is right. Your job is to exercise your moral judgment to determine what is right in any given circumstance. And that is a core and sacred duty that prosecutors have to uphold. Um, I think that though to be able to do that and lead an office that does that requires that you give people the tools, the training, the resources, the information, and the mentorship they need to carry that out. Because as a DA's office, you can do it when you're in the room, but you've got to empower people with the ability to be able to make those decisions. Because a lot of times when prosecutors make bad decisions, it comes from a place of fear or not understanding what's going on. And you know that can also lead to a lot of inability to retain people who could be really good prosecutors and want to go out and serve their community. I mean, Ms. Gonzalez is right. People don't do it for money. They want to be part of a team where they feel like they're being supported, they're growing in their personal and professional development, and they're getting an opportunity to serve their community. So to me, um, you know, you've got to be able to lead from a place of experience to deliver on the ethics of what it means to be a prosecutor, which I think is sacred to the criminal justice process. Thank you for the question philosophy. To me, it comes down to vision. As a leader, do you have a vision for the office that you're about to take? And can you convey that vision to those who work with you? Many of you probably have been managers of other people and have worked with people and know that it's probably the most difficult thing to balance people's interests with an interest that's greater than them, a public interest. What I have spoken to with my staff is always that every case that we look at, and we look at each one, that we answer one question. What is in the interest of justice? We talk about seeking truth, not convictions. We talk about looking at the facts. We talk about looking at the evidence. We talk about being able to meet the burden of beyond a reasonable doubt. And so many times when we see some of these cases that are out there in the news and people say, well, that person got arrested, therefore they're guilty. That's not the way the system works. The way the system works is that there might be probable cause, which is the lowest standard for an officer to arrest somebody. But we, as prosecutors in the district attorney office, have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And building a house is always more difficult than throwing rocks to bring it down. It was interesting that he talks about our moral judgment. It is not our moral judgment. It is the law that we follow. It is the law that we follow that is also factored in by the community that we are in. I've always said that there is the spirit of the law and there is the letter of the law. And if we need or feel that the letter of the law is not what our community wants it to be, then that is advocacy to be done at the legislative point, not in the courtroom. Deborah, this, uh, this will be a question she will get okay. first, and actually it's two separate questions. Uh, begins with, it's sometimes said that the elected district attorney is an office manager who oversees the work of the assistant district attorneys or ADAs and guides the philosophy and policy of the entire district attorney's office. So Deborah, as incumbent, how do you feel your experience in managing the DA's office during the first term will be a benefit in the second term? Yes, that's a great thing. And I also want to say we just don't have lawyers in the district attorney's office. I know that becomes a real focal point about the ADAs, the assistant district attorneys, but we also have victim advocates. We also have investigators. We also have some administrative staff like a records clerk and like the community outreach division that I created in the office. So it's not just about managing attorneys who tend to be very risk adverse, but it's also about managing different people with different roles in that office. So the first time that you ever go into any elected position Right? It's very easy from the outside to say, I know what I should do. How many of you have been backseat drivers? Right? 
or you might be Sunday morning quarterbacks because you saw the game. But at that moment when things are happening, people are making decisions with the resources that they have and the best of the information that they have at that moment. And sometimes what you think you have is not really what is there. Whether it's from another ADA or another person in the office, whether it's from a defense attorney, whether it's from a law enforcement officer, a lot of the work that we do is trying to cipher out the credibility of the people that we're actually working with in this particular office, that we do it. What you always do though is you learn. Every experience is an opportunity for learning. We follow the Kaizen, which is the Japanese word for continuous learning. Why? Because no two situations are the same. No two victims are the same. No two defendants are the same. No two cases are the same. And each one is a unique opportunity to bring justice to our community, and they need to be addressed singularly and uniquely in that way. So what happens in the second term? You take what you learn in the first term and you expand on that. Thank you. Kalki, although you have been an ADA in the past, you've not managed an office the size of the Western Circuit's DA office. What will be your managerial approach to in running the DA office? Yeah, no, I mean, look, there's no arguing that. I haven't managed the district attorney's office here, and I mean, I think it's probably the largest law office in the circuit. Um, you know, when I'm talking about leading people, what I've always thought is that, one, you make sure that people know that they are valued and that you appreciate the work that you are asking them to do. You understand the difficulty of it. Two, you, um, you empower them with the tools and knowledge they need to be able to do that job well. Um, you have to give them a position where they're put in a position to succeed. Then whatever they do, you affirm them in that. When they do well, you give them credit for doing well. When things go poorly, which they will sometimes, you make sure that they understand that if they are doing things from an ethical perspective, they're working their cases correctly, and they're doing the job that you, the way you train them to do, that you know things are gonna happen, we're gonna move forward and get better by it every day. And then the last thing that I think you have to do in leading people in general is that you have to give them the opportunity to develop develop beyond just that core role, basic job duties. And then developing them, you're pouring into them from what you understand, what you've accomplished, and giving them the tools to go forward and move forward professionally. Um, you know, I have managed a, a private practice. Uh, I did run one of the four superior court courtrooms. I mean, I think that the budget process and the grant writing process will be a new process to me. But I mean, I don't know that saying I've done something before, even though it has gone very poorly and I've had massive turnover and missed grant deadlines that have cost this community hundreds of thousands of dollars, means that that is the type of experience and, and the type of performance that we need to continue with. It's like if somebody drives a car into the tree and says, I get to drive again because I'm the only one that's ever driven. I mean, I don't think that's what's best for this circuit. Okay, I appreciate your help with, with the, the question. Uh, I'm multitasking here. I'm trying to read ahead to see sure. where, we're, where we're going and who gets the question first and how that makes sense, as well as trying to listen to the two of you. And I think this might be a point where I would ask Deborah to respond, but we're, the next question has exactly to, deals with that, exactly the, that same issue, so you'll have a chance to respond in, in the next question. So, uh, Koki, you'll get a chance to start, and then Deborah will have a chance to respond. Uh, there have been reports in the media about low staffing levels and turnover in the district attorney's office over the last three years, especially as it relates to ADA staffing. This comes at a time when the local ACA county attorney's office, the AC, I'm sorry, the ACC county attorney's office, the athens Clark County Solicitor General's office, and the Western Circuit Public Defender's Office are fully staffed with attorneys. So, Koki, what are your plans to fully staff and maintain employment of ADAs? Yeah, one, I think it's, uh, you know, we need to talk about this in terms of fully staffing with experienced, qualified, and trained attorneys. Because I think as it stands now, I've heard Ms. Gonzalez say previously there are only two openings left in her office. 
Well, four of those people are people who aren't licensed to practice law in the state of Georgia. So per the statute, they actually don't meet the minimum qualifications to work as an attorney in the office. And they created a position called an apprentice assistant district attorney in order to allow those slots to be occupied uh, and those numbers to count towards a total. So, I mean, if you take those out, what you've got is 11 out of 17 positions filled. Um, it was three earlier this year, and there's been a lot of talk of, oh, my bad. There's been a lot of talk of, well, you know, I've hired eight new attorneys. Well, when you go down and look at it, only one of those people has any real criminal trial experience coming in. And so that's a solution to a political messaging problem, but it's not a solution to the problems that we're facing at the DA's office. And if you want to know whether or not what I'm saying is true, look at the trial results. In the last seven jury trials that they've had, they've lost six of them. And what's even more shocking than that is four of those cases cases, the DA's office wasn't even able to get to the point of the jury deliberating on the case. Whether it was something called a directed verdict or something that's called a mistrial, uh, the, the jury never even got the case because of the inability of the DA's office to complete kind of the basic stepping stones of trying a case. Um, and we're not talking about low-level cases either. I mean, one of those directed verdicts that didn't get to the jury was a shooting. The other one was a possession of a firearm by a convicted felon that was a mistrial because they violated the defendant's rights during the trial. They didn't give him a copy of the statement, and during the first witness of the case, they tried to introduce improper evidence. And I don't blame the ADA for that. That's somebody that hasn't been trained on how to appropriately try a case. So, Deborah, the question for you is, what effects, if any, has the attorney shortage had on the operations of your office and the courts? And what can be done to improve ADA staffing and turnover? Okay, well, first of all, let me make very clear that what those other officers' offices do and their attorneys is very different than what we do in our office, right? Public defenders have a very different role than a prosecutor has. A prosecutor has to build the house, Public defender just has to throw throws, throw rocks, and be able to cast enough doubt. A county attorney's office does not do criminal law. They do mainly civil law in that. The solicitor general is working on misdemeanors. They are not doing felonies. So please be careful when you start comparing. And also, none of those offices have the number of positions that we have in the district attorney's office. So I want to make it very clear that when you start saying, well, other legal offices don't have a problem, are you really comparing apples with apples, or are you just saying that all lawyers are the same because I think every lawyer here would say not all lawyers are the same and not all lawyers practice the same type of law. So let's first make that very clear. Um, secondly, in terms of recruitment and retainment, one of the things that when I walked in, there were 14 district attorney offices that changed leadership. What that meant was that there were 440 attorney vacancies in the state of Georgia on January 1st of 2021. That meant that there were all 51 district attorney offices looking to hire lawyers and prosecutors. We were all looking for the same people. And this is after COVID where people figured out, hey, I don't have to go into the courtroom eight to five and seven days a week. I can actually make a lot more money by not doing that. So also let's think about the circumstances in which we are putting these and talking about these situations of low turnover. The last thing I would say is that it's very important to have a pipeline in any business and in any office. You just can't have everybody who's at the top of the level because we don't pay enough. That is something that I've argued with the mayor and commission for years. We are not competitive in our salaries. Uh, this is such an important topic. I think I'd like to ask Kalki to take a minute and then Deborah to take another minute to respond to what Kalki says. Sure, yeah, well, and so uh, the the DA's office in Athens historically has never been a hard place in order to get people to work. People love Athens. There's a lot of people that have an affinity and connection back to Athens. Um, so it's always a place that never had more than two or three vacancies. And actually at the beginning of Ms. Gonzalez's term, she was able to fill vacancies when people left. I mean, people were coming in and filling those things. And her true staffing crisis probably started in the second half of 2022 and that's really when things went off the rails but what I'm doing 
already, as soon as I announced my candidacy, as I started calling people in various jurisdictions who used to work in this circuit or who I've met through criminal defense work, who are good prosecutors in other circuits and would rather live in Athens. Uh, and I've talked to over 12 people today. I had somebody stop me on the street today and tell me that their wife, who I had known from the law school class that I taught, uh, was interested in coming back and working in the office. So it is absolutely important to have a pipeline, which is why the loss of the connection with UGA Law School under the current administration has been so damaging. Deborah, would you like to take another minute to talk on this topic? Yes, thank you for that. Um, you know, one of the things that I'll say is that you have to change with the times. He is talking about how things were when he was in the office, that's over, I don't know, four, five, six years ago, right? He is talking to people who were in that office. He wants to bring that office back. This is what the community voted against. They did not want that office back. They want it changed, and yet that is what he is doing, going back, getting those same people, bringing them in, because that is what people were comfortable with then, and we have to ask, who was comfortable with that kind of office. I am proud of the diversity that we have. I am proud that we have people from different diverse backgrounds, whether that's sexual preference or whether that is race. It is important to have that diversity of perspective, and we have cultivated that very, very carefully. We have partnerships with different schools. It doesn't always have to be UGA. There are other law schools in the area that are close by that we can expand opportunities to students who never had them before. Uh, I think we could go back and forth on I this. Ask for a 30 second rebuttal. Uh, uh, I'm going to go to the next question. It's related. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, so the Western Judicial Circuit contains both Clark and Oconee counties, and Deborah, you should go first. Is there an ADA uh, solely assigned to handle the Oconee County caseload, and has the ADA staffing shortage impacted the prosecution of cases in Oconee County? Can you just repeat that last piece? Certainly. Because in the middle it's sort of like... Uh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll read the whole thing. Is there an ADA solely assigned to handle the Oconee County caseload? And has the ADA staffing shortage impacted the prosecution of cases in Oconee County? Yes, thank you. No, we ha do not have a dedicated Oconee ADA. What we have done is that our attorneys follow their judges. One of the reasons for that is because we were in a shortage. This is one of the two vacancies that I have that I want to fill so that we can have somebody in Oconee. But right now, it's actually been working out really well with our ADAs following their judges because they know these cases and they're able to, and they know the judges, they know the nuances. Every judge is individual. Every judge has their own way of doing things. And so being able to have that, um, what, before I was here, they had just one ADA who was in an Oconee. It was really hard for them to be able to practice in front of all four judges in this one place because they had to learn all four judges, and it was a lot on their caseload. And so we decided to change that, and we decided that our attorneys would follow the judges there. Kalki, from your knowledge, has the ADA staffing shortage impacted the prosecution of cases in Oconee County? Yes, it absolutely has in, in, in really dramatic ways. Um, I personally am aware of one client I represented, and I'm personally aware of another instance where the district attorney's office failed to charge crimes within the statute of limitations leading to the dismissal of those charges. They filed the charging document late, um, and so because of that, they couldn't move forward with the prosecution of the case. Uh, and if I know about two of them, I seriously doubt that those are the only two that have occurred. And I've asked for some data uh, that I've got to sift through, obviously, to, to get to the bottom of that. But basically what was happening is that a, a ton of cases that started in probate court, including cases like DUIs and including cases where people had multiple previous DUIs were essentially being ignored by the district attorney's office because there's nobody out there managing the caseload, which is what led to these statute of limitation violations. Um, I don't honestly know when the last time there was a jury trial in Oconee County was. I know one bench trial this year that Ms. Gonzalez conducted 
but I honestly don't know if there's even been a criminal jury trial in Oconee County this year. If there has, maybe it's been one or two. Um, but it, Oconee County, and this is something that doesn't get covered because Clark County has a much larger population, but there are victims in Oconee County too, and their suffering is no more serious just because they have less population in the circuit. And it's essentially being ignored by the district attorney's office at this point. Deborah, you I'd want like to, to respond rebut to that, that, if you yeah. wouldn't mind, yeah, take my please. 30 seconds take a minute, for that. Please. You know, there are many reasons why jury trials do not go forward. Sometimes they get resolved. Sometimes there is a plea agreement that's signed off by the judge. Sometimes there is a continuance that's requested, okay? It could be by the defense. It could be by the state. It could be a witness that is not available at that time and a continuance is asked for. And so even though we have these jury weeks that are sort of segregated to be jury weeks, there are many reasons why a jury trial may not go forward. That doesn't mean that the cases are not being resolved. 97% of cases in our circuit, just like the national average, are resolved by plea negotiations that are signed off by the Superior Court judges in order to be finalized. So it doesn't mean that everything has to go through a jury trial in order for us to have resolution. Koki, you want to take 30 seconds? Or? Uh, I think so if you, you don't have to. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, if we're talking about, you know, clearance rates and whether or not things are getting resolved, I mean, based on Ms. Gonzalez's office's own FIS or impact report, in 2020, they closed, or the office before Ms. Gonzalez came in, closed 64.71% of cases. Keep in mind, that's in COVID. Courts were shut down for over nine months, about nine and a half months during that time period. In fiscal year 2024, which is July 1 to June 30, 23-24, they closed 66.94% of their cases based on the report they put out. So you got an office with full court resources that's essentially operating at the same level that the COVID office did. Okay, so just as a reminder, the format was two minutes, then one minute for rebuttal, and 30 seconds for response. So that's what we're trying to follow. And uh, as I said, we could spend the rest of the evening on this issue, but there are other important ones, and I think this next one is another crucial question. Uh, during the election season, and especially in the wake of the recent U.S. Supreme Court Dobbs decision, issues surrounding abortion, abortion and reproductive rights are in the focus of many voters' minds. Georgia's Life Act, also known as the Heartbeat Bill, permits a district attorney to bring criminal charges and pursue imprisonment against those involved in seeking, performing, and or assisting with an abortion. While the law is still being actively challenged in Georgia courts, the statute remains in effect as of today. So, Kalki, this is yours to begin. What are your thoughts on prosecuting individuals under the Life Act? So first, um, you know, this isn't a theoretical discussion as far as accessing that type of health care for me and my family. Uh, before our first son was born, uh, Caitlin suffered a miscarriage and she had to have a DNC. Uh, and before our second son, James, was born, she had an ectopic pregnancy and had to seek care for that. Uh, the statute allows for certain medical exceptions. If there's a treating physician who is saying that they've provided care that falls within the medical exception, I am not a doctor, and as a lawyer, I'm not going to substitute my judgment for that person. Uh, that response has been spun in ways to try and scare people. The reason that it's really important that you don't say things like, I will categorically not enforce the law is what that's going to mean is we're going to lose control on a local level of the ability of our district attorney, who's more directly accountable to the voters here, to be held responsible for whatever decisions that person makes. And the reason I say that is you got a situation in Florida where a prosecutor said that about the death penalty and the governor took away every single murder case that was being considered for the death penalty in that office and it was upheld by the Florida Supreme Court. And so all making those categorical statements does, although it might be politically the easier thing to do, is lead to a situation where your DA in this circuit is not going to be the one that's going to be making the decisions in those cases. So, May I respond? Deborah, I'll repeat the questions. What are your thoughts on prosecuting individuals under the LIFE Act? Yeah, so I've been very vocal. This is something that is an issue that is extremely important to me. 
women should have autonomy over their own bodies. And I have been very vocal about that since the very beginning. I was, um, you know, an advocate against that six-week abortion bill. I have testified in the Capitol against that bill. I have said that I will look at every case that comes to my desk but I will not be prosecuting women who are seeking reproductive health. And I think it's also really important that we look at the dangerous slope that these kinds of bills had. In a recent interview, I was asked about abortion trafficking, and I just want to push back against that phrase a little bit. This is not about people being forced across borders and state borders to have an abortion. This is about people who are traveling to seek medical help that they cannot get in their home place. And I think it's very dangerous when we start putting out that we are now going to be prosecuting these people because instead of getting the health care that they need, they are dying. We have had these stories already two women who have died in Georgia, and we don't know how many more because these are reports that have come out two years after the fact of when this happened. So we are actually hearing the stories that are coming out from 2022. And it is important that sometimes your district attorney takes certain stances. I have already also said that I do not believe in the death penalty, but when we have our cases, we do review them with the family first as to how they feel about it and then we go through the options of what is a death penalty, what needs to happen when a death penalty is going to be presented. Did you know it cost $1.4 million to Georgia taxpayers to go through and have a death penalty case go all the way through? Do you know that that defendant gets two public defenders, capital defenders? Do you know that the defendant then becomes the center of attention for that and the victim is left in the waylaid? I'm not going to make that defendant the scapegoat or a martyr. Okay, my, my list has 16 questions on it. We have less than 10 minutes to finish them all. This was question Quick six. Round. Popcorn. Popcorn. This was question six. So I'd ask you to keep that in mind. We'll try to get at least three more questions in. And the next question was directed only at Deborah, and then there's another one only at you, Kalki. So we'll start with Deborah, then Kalki on these two individualized questions. Deborah, it says, in winning your first term as DA, you campaigned on what some would call a platform of progressive prosecution and transparency, stating that, and this is a quote I, I have to assume from you, criminal justice reform matters and that the old ways of doing things are no, no longer acceptable. You've been criticized by your opponent for not following through on those campaign promises. Do you feel you fulfilled the promises of your campaign? Yes, I do. I do. And I think, you know, I think I alluded to this earlier that sometimes you learn things after the fact, after you get into the seat, just what the restrictions actually are there, right? We get to have prosecutorial discretion. But at the end of the day, the person who does the final decisions, who is the arbiter finally in that courtroom, is the judge. So even if the defense and the state through my office come up, with a plea negotiation, it's still up to the judge, and many times the judge who will say, no, they will not accept it, or yes, they will accept it. And every plea negotiation that is accepted is signed by that judge. That's the only way that it goes through. Did I think it would be easier to implement some of these reforms? Yes, and I have tried more than once to do certain things that I have not been able to do. But part of that, I think, is because when you come into an office like this and you bring a vision, you see the ideal, you see what could be, and you're working towards that, and then you keep facing these obstacles of what cannot be done, and you have to take a step back and say, okay, I can't do it this way. How are we going to do it that way? How can we get it done? So for example, I am very proud that we have been able to do five resentencing with the Southern Center for Human Rights. One for a man who served 25 years for taking $45 because he had a pocket knife. When the victims even said they were not afraid of that, he served 25 years for that. And we had to go to the same judge who sentenced him. And when that judge went to sign that order, that judge said, well, I guess he served enough time. I am proud of the fact that we can go back and change and make those injustices right. Kalki, although you are running as an independent, you're receiving significant support financially and otherwise from Republicans. 
that support and the fact that you are, have that you worked as an ADA under Ken Malden has led to criticism that you are the law and order candidate who would return to those old ways of doing things in the Western Judicial Circuit. How would you address these criticisms? I think it is a, a false dichotomy to say that either you want to see reforms where nonviolent offenders are given access to resources and the opportunity to address root causes of problems, or you want a system in which serious violent felonies are prosecuted and those offenders are held accountable and justice delivered for those victims. I mean, that that's just not... Uh, a true choice. We can have both of those things. We can have an office that actually fully utilizes the accountability course that we have available. We can have an office that's out in the community and is focused on partnering with organizations and churches like this church or so many others that I've visited that are interested in investing their time and their resources in building relationships with young people to keep them out of trial. And we can also have an office that can try a murder case to a jury to a guilty verdict, try a sexual assault case to a jury to a guilty verdict, and try other serious violent felonies to a jury to a guilty verdict. We can do all of those things, and we deserve all of those things from a district attorney's office, and that's the kind of office that I'm going to build when I'm your next district attorney. If you want to know what kind of prosecutor I was, go and talk to people down at the courthouse. Talk to people at the public defender's office. What they'll tell you is that I showed up, every day with an eye towards doing right by each person involved in each of those cases. When push came to shove, I could deliver in the courtroom. I would always listen to people, whether they be family members of the defendant, defense attorneys, or other stakeholders in a case, because a prosecutor needs to know all the surrounding circumstances to make the right decision. We can have an office that functions with excellence in all those categories. You don't have to choose one or the other. Okay, I've been asked to take the, the following question and then we'll turn to questions that people have submitted tonight. Uh, and Kalki, this will be yours to answer first. Accountability courts are designed to treat offenders who suffer from mental illness, addiction, and other health issues using a treatment model combined with traditional court sessions to get at the root causes that drive recidivism. The Western Circuit has a long history of involvement in the accountability court movement with courts that currently serve as model courts for both the state of Georgia and the nation. What are your thoughts on these types of courts and how would you as DA direct your office to utilize and support our local accountability courts? Yeah, I always tell people, if you want to see something truly inspiring, go to an accountability court graduation. Go down to a felony drug court graduation, and you see people who are being having their families put back together. You see children stand up and talk about how they got their mother back or how they got their father back. These are proven to reduce the rate at which people reoffend, And beyond that, it's the right thing to do by folks who are having what we thankfully have come to recognize as a health issue, not some kind of moral character failing. And this circuit has been a leader in those areas. And to me, some of the util underutilization of those programs is kind of what's been the most distressing about what's been happening the last few years. We're going backwards in those areas. And, and if you want me to, you know, when you look and see where someone's priority are, where are we deploying our resources? Right now, the assistant district attorney assigned to the accountability courts is one of those attorneys who's not licensed to practice law in the state of Georgia. And the attorneys that are uh, assigned to the intake process where cases are initially screened and can be diverted early into pretrial diversion programs or into those accountability court programs are also people who are not licensed to practice law in the state of Georgia. So for me, yes, we absolutely need to use those more and I've actually, in the dozen or so conversations I've had with really experienced attorneys, in, including some that you know, used to work for Ms. Gonzalez, some that Ms. Gonzalez you know, offered jobs to initially or offered jobs to after they left the office, I've identified two people with you know, well over a decade of experience and who have worked with accountability courts who are interested in coming back and serving in those roles because we really need to revamp those. We need to commit resources to them, not just rhetoric. Yeah, so one thing that I do wanna make clear because sometimes people don't understand that the district attorney doesn't decide who goes into accountability courts, okay? There is a, a steering committee 
where people have to go and be screened. And a lot of times, it's the defense attorney who will suggest to their particular client whether they want to be screened for it or not. My office has never denied anybody from being screened, but there have been people who have been rejected from those particular accountability courts. They have high criteria. This is not an easy program to get through. It can take anywhere from 12, 18, 24 months to get through that process. So it, the DA's office is not that gatekeeper to the accountability courts. And we have supported them. And I can remember back in 2020 and in 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, people telling me I was the only DA who had ever gone to any of these graduations. And very proud to be there and to stand with people who have been able to get through that process, which is not an easy one, and kudos to them for being able to do that hard work. But at the end of the day, it is not up to the DA who gets into those programs or not, and we have never denied somebody from going and being filtered and screened. That is not the role that we play in those. Okay, I've been told to pick question 11 as our next one before we turn to the citizens' questions. Uh, many in our community are concerned about youth violence, sometimes also involving gang activity. Uh, what do you see as your role as elected DA in working to produce solutions to youth violence in our community? And Deborah, you should go first. Thank you. Yeah, this is very, very important. Why? It's one of the reasons why I started the Community Outreach Division, to be able to make sure that the community knew that they had partners in us, because we look at our work in three different areas, prevention, intervention, and then what happens in reentry. And a lot of what happens to people when they reenter the community depends on how they became system involved in the very beginning, and that especially with our youth. So for us, that was very, very important. In the very beginning, I actually took groups of people, including our juvenile judges, people from our community. We visited sites to see the front porch in Savannah, Wimberley Woods over in Barrow, learned about different models that they had in San Diego so that we can see what can we bring here and adapt here. And those were funded through my office through grant fundings that I was able to get and to take people to these so that we can look at that. I convened 28 youth organizations in 2021 to take a look at this holistically, to be able to go after grants of significant amounts. Because one of the things that I saw here was that this community gets a lot of money for youth violence prevention. We get millions of dollars. The problem is that money gets diverted to other things. It's one of the reasons why I spoke up at the mayor and commission meeting when they diverted $3.7 million from youth prevention programs to infrastructure. It's one of the reasons I was there because the community called on me and said, Deborah, please speak for us at this meeting. And I went there, okay, because Budgets are moral documents. Tell me what you spend your money on. I'll tell you what you value. And we were not valuing our children, and we need to value them. We can only do that if we invest the resources that are already committed to them. Do you need me to reread the question? No, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, thank you, though. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So what we know about gang recruitment, especially of children, is that it is done at times when either kids have gotten home from school uh, and they don't have extracurricular activities or some kind of positive adult supervision during that time period. And this isn't a knock on parents. I mean, kids get home from school at three o'clock and if a parent's working two jobs to pay the bills, you know, it, it may be hours before they get home. Um, or kids who are not going to school and so are out in the community even more during periods of unsupervised time when there are a lot of influences that aren't positive that can get to them. And then, you know, more recently, you're seeing a lot of recruitment happening through social media usage. So, I mean, I think absolutely working with community partners who can provide more extracurricular activities and structured activities with positive role models and influences for young people during those times when they're away for their parents is one factor that we have to do in youth violence prevention. Um, and then we go beyond kind of youth violence prevention. You touch on the question of gang activity, 
was, I believe, the second part of what you were talking about, Lee, you're asking in the question. And I think it's important that we still, in that circumstance, differentiate people who are affiliated with gangs, who are young, who have not committed a crime. Those are not the same people as people who are affiliated with gangs and who are committing serious violent felonies. When you talk about the people committing the crimes and furtherance of criminal street gang activity, you need to have people that can hold those people accountable and, and put them in a place where they can't hurt other people again. And I've been to the gang training right now. Thankfully, we have the Attorney General's office handling a lot of more serious gang stuff in our circuit. But we need to be able to do that as a DA's office because that's information that we need to have when we're talking about how do we divert kids away from that. Uh, we need to have direct contact with the most violent offenders in order to deliver justice in those cases too. Okay, I've, I've been handed nine questions from a, a fairly large number of questions submitted by the audience. So I haven't been handed extra time. So maybe you can try to lop 30 seconds off of the answers. And uh, Kalki, uh, I'm going to go first with you. Do you agree that issues like truancy are issues for a district attorney? Yeah, I do. And I, I think it comes when people talk about what happens in juvenile court. It's very important that we understand that juvenile court at its core is more like a treatment and accountability court than what you would consider a superior court to be like. Juvenile court outside of designated felonies and some other more serious juvenile offenses should, when it's operating appropriately, about be about the best interests of the child and providing that child with resources. And if you're ignoring truancy, um, a lot of times truancy can be an indicator of a child undergoing physical or sexual abuse. A lot of times truancy is going to open a child up to be recruited by gang activity. So when we talk about dealing with truancy, we're not talking about putting people in jail. We're not talking about that. What we're talking about is a lot of times it's the first contact some family that's at a crisis point might have with resources that are available to them that they don't know how to access that can help those kids and help that family. Everything from wraparound services to, and I mean, just various different things. So it goes back to the idea that prosecute does not mean seek a maximum sentence. doesn't mean seek a conviction. A lot of times it means to use the statutes and the law to intervene in a positive way for a family, a child, or a person suffering from some kind of underlying issue. Yeah, so I do not believe that truancy should be something that the district attorney should get involved with, and I, that's something else that I've been vocal about. Why? Because too often what we do is we take the most difficult questions and issues of the community and throw it to the criminal justice system. We have nowhere else to put people with mental illness, throw them in jail. We have nowhere else to deal with children who are not going to school, throw them in jail. I do not believe in the separation of family is ever going to be helpful. And what I have said to the schools is we have to find better ways. And if it means that that child is going through some kind of abuse, then we need social workers there to help them. We do not need a police officer putting handcuffs. And the other thing that I will never do is I will never issue an empty threat. And when you start saying that you're going to prosecute things, the only way that you're going to get those parents supposedly to adhere is if they fear that you're actually going to put them in jail because they're going to learn very quickly that if you're not going to do it, it's empty threats. And that's not going to help the child. So we have to find other ways to deal with this issue than just keep batting it off to the criminal justice system. Deborah, I have two questions, related questions, um, submitted by an audience member. What would you do to reduce the number of juvenile African-American youths who are brought into the criminal justice system? And what policies would you put into place to ensure fair and unbiased use of prosecutorial discretion in juvenile cases? You know, one of the things that I've done is I have created a restorative justice program in our juvenile courts. And I know for some people this is a little bit of a controversy, but what we've seen in the research that we've seen is that a lot of it depends on how it gets implemented, who's involved, right? And one of the things that we've done, we've partnered with the Georgia Conflict Center. We set up a steering committee. We even invited the public defenders to be part of that steering committee. 
Um, and the, the chief of that public defender said no, they didn't want any part of being part of that steering committee. So we actually didn't have them as part of those conversations. But it was really important to us to have different stakeholders from the community look at this and see what we can do. Why? Because once your system involved, your system involved. It is very difficult and it becomes generational and it's very hard to get somebody out of it. And so what we are trying to do is not get them system involved at all. Since tw late 2021, I have been advocating for a community justice center. Uh, this is a model that actually the community can resolve issues that are happening without a judge, without a prosecutor, without a defense attorney, because many of the solutions are right there in the community, because many times the person who hurts and the person who is hurt are from the same community. They're neighbors. They might even be families. And they are the ones who come up with a lot of solutions. So to me, there are other ways that we can do this. Yeah, uh, so it, first, I commend on Ms. Gonzalez on her restorative justice program in juvenile court. There have been restorative justice programs previously in, ju in juvenile court, like teen court. I think juvenile court is a great place to explore re restorative justice programs, uh, especially because of what I just talked about, as far as juvenile court being a place where primarily the focus is on the best interests of the child is far less punitive than adult courts. Um, but those restorative justice programs inside the juvenile court, that juvenile has already become system involved at that point. So when you're talking about how do you proactively get out and, and do those things as a district attorney's office, I mean, to say that the DA's office is going to be the person driving the boat on those things. I think it comes from, you know, maybe a place where a little bit of hubris, and I'm not talking to say Ms. Gonzalez is saying this, but if you say that, you're coming from a place of hubris about where your, uh, your um, expertise is. What you need to do is go out and be a partner with community stakeholders who are already in that space and working. And there are tons of great organizations here, whether it be boys and girls clubs, various programs and centers, whether it be churches that are having uh, programs on youth empowerment at their prayer breakfasts on Saturdays. I mean, there's a lot of people already in that space. And so serving as a liaison in a communication, being open to hearing from those people and forming programs with them, whether they be extracurricular programs or something like that. I mean, I think one of the things we can do is really look at a way in which financial barriers don't keep kids out of extracurricular sports or other programs. And I, I honestly, I did not realize that Clark County Leisure Services doesn't have a flag football program. I mean, that's something that would keep kids engaged and if you compare that with community stakeholders like churches to be coaches or first responders to be coaches, you can really build a structure for that kid where they've got somewhere to go and they have someone to lean on as a positive role model. Okay, I have two uh, related questions, and Kalki, they're separate for the two of you. So, Kalki, I'm going to ask you to take yours first. It says, what procedures would you put in place to protect the rights of victims or victims' relatives and keep them informed of developments in cases? Yeah, so I mean, this touches on Marcy's Law. Before it was Marcy's Law in Georgia, those rights were protected by the Georgia Crime Victims Bill of Rights, and then Marcy's Law made it a constitutional amendment. So it was something that we were dealing with back when I was at the district attorney's office. I mean, part of it comes from having an office that isn't in a place of kind of disorder, um, you know, as things are, are being dealt with, just right as they're popping up on the calendar for tomorrow or two days from now, that's going to lead to situations where victims aren't notified. I mean, I think that the biggest thing is, it is the victim advocate's responsibility to liaison between the victim and the district attorney's office, but especially in the most serious violent felonies, prosecutors shouldn't be doing things on those cases without having a conversation themselves with those victims. I mean, the idea that a plea would be entered in a case where someone had died without the prosecutor having either spoken on the phone directly with or sat in the room with the victim's family to talk about what was going to happen, or that a sexual assault case, particularly one against a child, would be dismissed without you know, coordinating with that child or that child's family, it, it, that that stuff should never happen. There can be circumstances where, where maybe some kind of 
bond hearing notification on, on a theft offense or a low-level felony falls through the cracks, but especially in the most serious violent felonies, we owe it to those victims because they don't get to shop around and pick their own lawyer. You know, if I go in a room and I want to get a will written, I can interview three different lawyers. Those people come in, they've had the worst thing in their lives happen to them because of crimes been committed against them. We've got a duty and an obligation a duty and an obligation as a community to provide those people with well-trained, well-resourced, experienced and committed prosecutors that can get the job done and who will be there as a guide for them through the criminal justice process. May I read that? Thank you. You know, one of the things that we're very proud of is that we started a partnership with UGA School of um, Social Work and also Athens Tech with their program as social work. So for the first time, my office actually has social work interns who have been with us since 2021. This was a first of its kind in terms of internships in the DA office. We've also encouraged our victim advocates to go back to school, to go and seek more um, study and more education in social work. And last, you know, the other thing that we're doing is doing national credentialing of our victim advocates, all of which take time, but all of which are being systematically put into place so that we can go forward. You know, in 2023, it was a very challenging year. We were understaffed. We had to make sure that the priority was cover the courts when they were there at the moment that they needed to be, and everything else had to take a second step back. You have to set priorities because resources are scarce. Debra, you. I, the, your question is in the same area, and so I'm going to ask you this question and then give Kalki a, another minute to respond to you. Uh, so could you explain your timing on notifications of crime victims, victims' relatives, of hearings, trials, et cetera? Yes. Yeah, so once we get a calendar, right, and we also get real nice size, real nice size are sort of like the document that comes from the judge's office. The judges are the ones who do all the scheduling. They send a rule NISI, which basically says, okay, this is going to be a hearing or a trial or a bond modification. This is the date. This is the time. This is the courtroom. This is when it happens. From there, the victim advocate is supposed to put it into our tracker system. This is a case management system. It is not a data management system. It is a case management system. And then from there, we start preparing the cases, whether in whatever um, status it may be, intake, pre-arraignment, after arraignment, active, ready for the grand jury, or ready to go to trial, right? Um, so that is the way that the scheduling is done. Back in 2023, we were short. So when you're short, you have to use the resources that you have. You're gonna prioritize some things over others. But most of the time, and we are very proud of the fact, we have resolved over 7,500 cases in the last three and a half years. We have also served anywhere between 12,000 and 17,000 victims in the last three and a half years. So if you want to talk about Marcy's Law violations, you know, you're talking about less than 0.1% of what we've done in our office. And so we're proud of the record that we have, and we're getting better every single day. Okay, you want to take a minute? Sure. Um, so you talk about prioritizing resources. The priority has to be on the serious violent felonies. It has to be on the murders, vehicular homicides, sexual assaults, armed robberies. Those things are very serious violent felonies. And so I'm not talking about every single instance, but those two in particular to me. And I want to drill down on the one where there was a young African-American child whose father had been sexually assaulting her, and she was ready to face her accuser in court. Um, she had been told that this is going to trial and she's going to testify. Uh, and after jury selection started, the district attorney's office dismissed that case, saying there wasn't enough evidence to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, thankfully, Marcy's law violation was brought. The DA's office here was conflicted out of it, and Randy McGinley from the Alcove circuit came over to handle the case. He tried it in Clark County to Clark County jury. That man was convicted in about an hour or less of deliberation, and it was sentenced to life in prison. So the reason we need to allocate our resources in the most serious violent cases is that these are the stakes that we are talking about, and this is what happens when you don't do the job the right way, regardless of whether anyone is watching. So, Deborah, you had had the second question, second, you had had the chance to respond second, so I want to go to you first for this next one, which is related. It says, regarding, 
Regarding victim services, if a victim is homeless, moved, or does not want to be found, how will you guarantee victims' rights? Yeah, it's very difficult. You know, our investigators spend a lot of time when the victim or even a witness is homeless. They go out to the sparrow's nest. They go out into the woods looking for them. They go out to the camps. Um, they go out to try to find these people. But the truth is that sometimes they don't want to be found. Okay, and when they don't want to be found and they don't want to come to court, then we cannot prove those cases and we have to dismiss them. And there are many reasons why a victim might not want to come forward or a witness might not want to come forward. They might be afraid. They might feel that, you know what, it's not going to make a difference. Or they might feel that they have put this behind them and they don't want to deal with the issue anymore. There are many, many reasons why a victim or witness will not want to come up. But the homeless are especially transient, and it is very, very difficult to find them. So, you know, sometimes we are looking up to the very day, the very morning before a trial is going to happen for these individuals after our investigators have been out there passing out cards, telling people that we are looking for them to please call us. There's only so many efforts that we can do to find an individual, and when they do not want to be found, you cannot find them. Yeah, so, I mean, look, that is absolutely true. I mean, homeless victims and homeless witnesses are some of the most challenging issues. The first thing you got to do, though, is you can't let the case get old before you get it moving. So, I mean, if you wait two or three years to indict a case where a key witness or the victim is a homeless person, you're already starting behind the eight ball. And, it, and frankly, you cannot do this in every single case. But again, in prioritizing resources, when you know you've got a key witness that's homeless, was an either a a murder or some kind of other serious violent felony, you need to make contact with that person early. Generally, in the immediate aftermath of the police interaction is going to be when you got the best location information. Then you make a plan with that person. You make a schedule of, hey, we're going to come in and check in on you about once a month or so. If something happens, you're thinking about moving, you know, get with us about that. Does that work every time? No, it doesn't work every time, but it puts you in a better position than you get a trial calendar published and, you know, three weeks from now, this murder case or this sexual assault is coming up for trial. Well, we got to go find this person. Well, when's the last time we talked to him? Well, about two and a half years ago, he was, you know, in that encampment kind of off of Prince Avenue. Well, then you're really starting from nowhere. And like I said, again, you can't do this in every case. And that's why when you're deploying those resources, you really need to prioritize the most serious violent felonies that are occurring in the office and have a plan in place. Be proactive, not reactive. Okay, Kalki, this one is for you to start with. Uh, what will you do when police fail to do complete investigations, not write a complete report, or fail to take full witness interviews? So if you have experienced prosecutors screening those cases when they first come in, you send it back to the detective. I understand you've already taken this warrant, but you guys need to go talk to X, Y, or Z person. You know, you didn't get good information as far as contact information for this witness. Hey, like, I don't like the way this lineup was done. We need to talk about this so you do it better the next time around. That's another one of the roles of the district attorney's office, and I think it's covered in the statute somewhere, is that the district attorney's office is also meant to kind of be an advisor and trainer of law enforcement. And so you need to build that, you know, what you might refer to as a peer relationship, right? So like Jerry Salter's chief of police, our dog buddy is a dog we got from Jerry. I've got a great relationship with Jerry, but that can't be the only relationship. I need my chief assistant to have good relationships with the deputy chiefs and the captains. I need my courtroom trial leads to have good relationships with the sergeants. I need my trial line prosecutors to have the detective's cell phones and for the detectives to have their cell phones, because that's something I always did. You know, I was available beyond 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and I would have people call me before an arrest was made to talk about what was going on, what they had, and what they needed to do. So you need to build a relationship there because then when it comes to the point of an investigation that hasn't been done properly, look, not every person that gets arrested for the, by the police, even when it's a really serious case, 
is there going to be enough evidence to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt? And when you're having a hard conversation with somebody about that and about the fact that, hey, we are not going to be able to prosecute this case because the evidence isn't there, it works much better and it's easier, especially for younger, less experienced attorneys who could otherwise be intimidated to be able to have that conversation if they've got a pre-existing relationship and there's a mutual respect between the parties and they've been told that that's their role. Yeah, I think it's really important when we look at this kind of relationship between the DA's office and other law enforcement agencies. And when it comes to the police, it's sort of like you got to be really careful because the other thing is, is that the DA's office is the one that does some oversight on law enforcement. So if there is a use of force incident, if there is an officer involved shooting, there's a certain objectivity that we have to have with these officers. We cannot be hand in hand with them because we actually oversee them. And so when they are brought up on potential charges and the GBI is putting out their reports, we have to have a certain distance so that we can have objectivity when we look at it. And we have, we, we have had incidences where law enforcement, all of a sudden the sound is gone on their body camera and they never put it back on. All of a sudden they've done a bad stop and we're gonna have to suppress the evidence that they brought because they did that bad stop. And there have been you know, decisions that we have made in our office where we've told the law enforcement officer, this is not a good stop, we cannot use this, we are going to have to dismiss this case. But we've also followed up with them whenever we've had these kinds of motions to suppress so that they can understand what happened, what they need to do better, and how it is and what it is that we need as prosecutors to build that case. Because our investigators are not detectives. We do not go out and investigate the case. We depend on what our law enforcement partners bring to us. And there have been many times where we have told them we need more and we have been ignored. We have had subpoenas not adhered to Okay, and we have worked with Chief Salters to make sure that that does not happen again. And when those issues come up, they are addressed swiftly and we're able to continue and do the work that needs to be done. Okay, unfortunately, this is going to have to be our last question. And I'll start with you, Deborah. Um, the, the questioner says, as a daughter of legal immigrants who worked for eight years to get U.S. citizenship through the naturalization process, I would like both candidates to comment on the perceived conditions that Athens is a sanctuary city. I'm not sure what the word condition means here. But let's go with the perception that Athens is a sanctuary city. So the, the reason why I hesitate is I don't think it's something that the DA can actually do anything about. Right? I mean, I can tell you my view. My family is from Puerto Rico. We are born citizens. Now, that doesn't stop ICE from arresting us and, and saying, you know, that they want to deport us. They're going to deport us back to a territory that's the U.S. That has happened. Um, I have been vocal against 287 and agreements made by the sheriff because they are not a state agency that should be holding people. If ICE wants to come and get people, they should do that. That's their role. We should not be using our local resources for that. Now, I know there is a piece of legislation that is trying to make it automatic and take that discretion away from the sheriff's office and say, no, you know, Georgia is going to be this. As for a sanctuary city or not, that is not something within the purview of the DA that we can even decide. That is something between the mayor and commission. And I'm, you know, I'm somebody, I'm going to stay in my role <laughs> as to what I can do and what I cannot do. And I think it's important that we realize that there are just some things that you may know my name. And I know sometimes people have an issue and they say, Deborah, right? And they come to me because they know my name, but there is nothing that I can do about it. You know, I support immigrants. I believe that they contribute a lot to our community, and I support them, and I have stood with them back when there were being family separations, which I spoke out against. But this idea of sanctuary city or not is not in the purview of the district attorney. Okay. 
the designation or perception or however you want to define it is absolutely not a role that the DA's office plays. I mean, everyone in my family besides me and my sister are immigrants. My parents are immigrants. All of my first cousins are immigrants. Um, you know, my uncle who lived here until he passed away was an immigrant. Um, and so what I would say from district attorney's office perspective is that we are going to apply the law equally and fairly to all people. If you break a law and you are in the country lawfully, we will prosecute you. If you are breaking a law and you are in the country unlawfully, we will also prosecute you. That's our role in the process and do it fairly and equally. Apply the law to all people and seek justice in those cases. And so that's what I do as DA. Okay. Um, it's eight o'clock <laughs> right on, on the hour. Uh, so Deborah, you answered that one first. You also did, I think. Do you want to go first or last? I'll go last. You go. Okay. I think that would be fair because you did the inter, you know, introduce yourself second. So that would be, that'd be right. Okay. Uh, first, thank you to Reverend Lett and Hill Chapel Baptist Church again. Thank you again to Lynx Incorporated and the Western Circuit Bar Association. And thank you, everybody. I mean, Lee already pointed it out, but all of you are engaged. You are here on a Tuesday night, and you've stayed to the end. I appreciate that. I appreciate being a part of a community where people are that dialed into what's happening on the local level. Um, I think it's important as a community that we understand that we don't have to choose between a DA's office that is well-trained and experienced and can deliver results in the courtroom and a DA's office that's engaged in the community, wants to connect nonviolent people alleged to have committed a crime with resources that can help them better their lives and wants to be there for young people to give them resources and relationships that can make them better decisions. That, that is a false choice. We can have both, we deserve both, and we should demand both when we vote in this district attorney selection. I have the training, the experience, and the commitment to build that type of office. I'm an experienced prosecutor, and I've been an experienced criminal defense attorney. I want that office for this place that my wife and I and our family, our children love. It's where we decided to build our family, where we've sunk our roots and where we're staying. And I know that you and your family deserve that. I know that my and my, me and my family deserve that. And I know that every single person in this community deserves that. And you can be a part of building that district attorney's office. I would be honored to have your vote whether it be during early voting, which started today, or on November 5th on Election Day, so that we can build an office for this community that's dedicated to doing the right thing the right way, regardless of whether anyone is watching. So three things I want to leave you with after I say thank you to everybody. And I won't lay out everybody because I know I'm going to forget a name. But you know me. I am the same person I was four years ago. And four years ago, I came in with a vision. And that vision hasn't changed. It might have been sidetracked. It might have been slowed down by forces beyond our control. But we never lost that vision of what justice can be for our community. What you haven't heard from my opponent is, who is he? What are his values? What's his plan? What's his concept of a plan? He never tells you that. What he tells you is that, oh, this office is dysfunctional. If it was that dysfunctional, then crime wouldn't be down two years in a row. Violent crime down by 10%. If it really was that dysfunctional, we would be having a very different conversation here. So that's one. Number two, remember that when I walked into the office, there was criticism back then. A whole county wanted to secede. Nothing has changed. Those critics who were loud then are loud now. They didn't vote for me then. They're not going to vote for me now. They weren't with the community then. They're not with the community now. Remember that. It just got louder because the election is coming up, and everything that they have tried to do has not worked to get me out of the seat and has not worked to stop me from fighting for this community. And number three, stick the course. Anything worth it 
takes time. Anything worth it means we have to fight for it. And just because something hasn't happened to you doesn't mean that it hasn't happened to other people. And there is stuff out there where they say things that I've said happened to me didn't happen to me. Why? Because it didn't happen to them? But that doesn't negate anybody else's experience, including those who are system involved. And we need to keep that in mind. We need to keep the faith. We need to be persistent. We need to keep fighting for the justice that we want and not allow it to be taken right at the moment that we are making those changes. Because four years ago when I walked in, they didn't want me then, they don't want me now, they wanted the old system, and guess what? This system did not change me and I continue to fight it every single day for my community. And the last thing that I will say is, the reason why you know me is because I never disappeared. I got elected and I stayed being out there in the community, not just in churches, but at events, in different events all over our community, in Athens, and Oconee. People know my name because I am out there. People know my name because when they call me, I answer. Thank you. So now we can thank you.